Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. We are going to move to our keynote speaker. So we'll ask if you could uh, try to dual purpose with your food and uh, pay attention to the best you can. Uh, and I think you should want to because this next session, um, we're going to have a, have a year-long set of activities going on in the United States with this uh, being our global uh, contribution. The connection here is that Dr. Gregory J. Vincent is serving as the Grand Sire Archon, the national president for Sigma Pi Phi fraternity, which is also known as the Boule. In his over 30 year career, Dr. Vincent has served as an educator, president, attorney, assistant vice chancellor, vice president, for numerous organizations and academic institutions across the United States. Most recently, he served as the 27th president of the Hobart College and the 16th president of William Smith College in Geneva, New York. As an educator, his scholarship and teaching explored issues including educational equity and access and diversity in higher education. He taught at the University of Texas, Austin, the University of Oregon, and Louisiana State University. In addition to his work as a part of the academy, Dr. Vincent has served as an assistant attorney general in the office of the Ohio Attorney General and Director for Regional and Legal Affairs at the Ohio Civil Rights Commission and played a major role in the case of Fisher versus the University of Texas in which the U.S. Supreme Court ruled to uphold the use of affirmative action in higher education. Another important distinction as I bring him uh, to the front is that he was a part of the inaugural class of the Warrior Awardees, which was a very uh, important and groundbreaking opportunity for the International Colloquium. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gregory Vincent. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Good. I first want to thank Dr. Moore uh, for serving as co-chair. Uh, you are doing an outstanding job at my alma mater, the Ohio State University. Uh, and we certainly appreciate all of your hard work and your leadership, both as a scholar but now as a leader on campus, can we give Dr. Moore a round of applause? And to my dear friend and brother, Dr. Jackson, thank you for your leadership. Uh, it was truly an honor to uh, be named to the inaugural class in Atlanta. Um, boy, time flies, uh, but here we are in, in Dublin. And I have to say, now I always appreciate the wisdom of my my dear friend Dr. Jackson, and when he said we were going to Ireland, I'm like, really? Like what? <laughs> and it shows you what you don't know. And so, thank you for this incredible opportunity. Thank you for your work both at the University of Wisconsin and also in the Boule, where you serve as the chair of our Grand Social Action uh, Committee. Uh, this is our effort, and then we've been doing this since 1915, where without fanfare, we have worked uh, to improve 
our communities and Dr. Jackson leads our international efforts uh, to do this work. So can we give Dr. Jackson a round of applause? And as mentioned, we are uh, doing a live stream and, and I really want to thank uh, the both Sigma Pi Phi fraternity as well as the Boule Foundation uh, because as, as Dr. Jackson mentioned, uh, we are serving as a co-sponsor and we're doing that for several reasons because this is consistent with our mission. Since 1904 when we were established uh, by six medical uh, professionals and I just want to just take a moment to, to, because we overlook, we talk about these six, uh, uh, four physicians and, um, and a pharmacist and, and a dentist. This, in 1904, appreciate what that means, right? So we were founded in Philadelphia. These six founders were not just the most educated people in Philadelphia or the United States. They were the most educated men in the world. And they founded an institution that stands for excellence and service. And I'm going to talk about institutions a little bit later, but I just want to talk about the, 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 the foundation for which we uh, stand and build on this work. And so, as mentioned, as part of our foundation, uh, we um, award a number of, of grants. And we felt, as, as a member of the committee, we felt that the colloquium was a worthy uh, recipient of a grant and because of uh, this year-long work to uh, identify and, and recognize one of the most important figures in world history. And despite the false claims of a certain national figure, <laughs> Frederick Douglass, on the, upon at the time of his death, was, was perhaps the most recognized person right. in the United States. Right. And so while we're very happy to continue to recognize him now, let's give him his due respect. He was recognized and has been recognized. And in fact, given some of our meager black history, one person we did learn about, right? We learned about Frederick Douglass, right? So he's someone who we know. And why? Because for me, he sets both the moral tone but also was the precursor for so much of the work that we even do today. But I think it's important before we kind of get into this call to action, we need to remember who and what Frederick Douglass, who he was and what he stood for. The first thing we have to say, and I, and I need to say this because one common thing you're gonna hear throughout my presentation is that we have to talk plainly and clearly about these issues. The only way we're going to really have a laser focus on the issues at hand, we have to not sugarcoat who and what we are. So the first thing we have to identify about Frederick Douglass was that he was chattel. He was property of someone else. He started his life not as a free person, but as a slave. He did not have any rights in the Dred Scott decision that any white person had had to respect. He was chattel. He broke the law. He ran away. It was legal to own him, yet he broke away. In fact, the reason why he moved, uh, he, had, he came abroad, was that he had this, uh, uh, he published this very well-received book, and it caused attention, and during that time, it was legal to bring this fugitive back to justice. So the reason why he goes to Ireland and England is to get away from that legal law. And, and one of the things that, that I've shared with my students, and I, and I think it's important for you to understand, some of the most egregious acts in human history have occurred under a legal regime. Say that. Some of the most egregious acts in human history have occurred under a legal regime. Every act that, was, that occurred during the Holocaust was attached to a legislation, legal regime. 
Chattel slavery was legal. State-sponsored segregation was legal. We celebrate Rosa Parks and Dr. King. They also broke the law. And so we have to be careful about what's legal and what's justice, right? And so, and so I, I wanna just put that on as to why he's here. Why did he go to Ireland and why did he go to London? So we know who he was. He was chattel and he was a fugitive. He was also someone, as I mentioned, who understood and, and stood for and understood that he was a moral compass. He understood the shared humanity and the opportunities and struggles of people that looked like him, but people who did not look like him. One of the most profound things that I learned in, in during his time here in Ireland is that he connected with those persons in Ireland who were just beginning to suffer from the famines. He understood their shared struggle and made the connection between the, the Irish farmers who were living in what he called mud huts and his own brothers and sisters who lived in chattel slavery back in the States. He understood the shared humanity and the shared struggle. So he's someone who served as a moral compass. He also understood the global context. And one of the things that's so important for all of us is that we have to look beyond our boundaries and indeed our tribe. We have to understand and connect up with people beyond our natural and in some cases artificial boundaries and borders. We have to understand our shared struggle and our shared humanity. And it was indeed um, Frederick Douglass who talked about the color line and connecting with the brown and black people across the globe back in 1883, although, of course, it's W.E.B. Du Bois who, was, who famously coined that phrase back in 03, 1903 about the problems of the 20th century will be the color line. But it was Douglass who actually first, first introduces that term. So he understood this global context. And so we have to make sure that we understand that. And so why, for example, do we care about what happened to this journalist in Saudi Arabia? Why is that important? Why is that critical for us? Why is it important that what happens in Africa, in Latin America, in Europe, why are those things important? Why should we care? Because we are connected. And as Dr. King said, we're all caught up in an inescapable network of mutuality. We have to be aware and be concerned and be willing to take action when our brothers and sisters across the globe are facing injustice. He was a feminist. And it's complicated. Because one of the things that we don't like to talk about is that we, always, we all want to say that we are in this kumbaya moment, women's rights and the rights of, of racial justice, they went hand in hand. No, they didn't. And in fact, one of the real challenges that we've had in this quest for civil rights in this country is the tension between women's rights and the rights of racial justice. But what, what, what made so, Frederick Douglass so compelling was that he kept it plain. He talked about the need for racial justice for black men and black women, while also advocating for the rights of women to vote, even when some of the leaders of the women's rights movement turned on the quest for racial justice. So he never wavered from that. He knew what was right, even when he called out the hypocrisy. And that feminism was something that was part and parcel of who and what he was. He also was an advocate for education. And he also understood, he was a self-taught person, but he understood the institution of education. And it was indeed that ethos, it was that tradition that civil rights advocates like Charles Hamilton Houston and Thurgood Marshall picked up on because when you think about when they started this quest to, to end state-sponsored segregation, there were many issues facing 
African Americans. Lynching, housing, criminal justice, labor. But they chose education because they understood that if you fought for education, if you were an educated person, you had a passport to a better life mm -hmm. and that you could engage in community and indeed protest and struggle and indeed liberation, not just for yourselves, but for your community, which is why there was the emphasis on education. So set in a context for who Frederick Douglass is, we have to put it in this historical context. And what I want is particularly for students, by show of hands, how many students are currently in school? Good. One of the things that I hope you take away from this conference is that you have to put this knowledge to action. And one of the reasons why I'm so honored to do the call to action is because this knowledge can't just be for you. And certainly it can't be with this false notion that I got here by myself. If you don't understand the connection, the historical context, how you got here, and how, how many people sacrificed for you to get here, you've missed it. And nothing else that I say matters. If you take nothing else from what you've learned here today, is that we are here because others had the vision, the courage, the fearlessness to set the foundation, create institutions, protect those institutions, so that we could be here today. We stand on the shoulders of giants. And so we have to understand that context so that we can continue that work. Because I can tell you that there are some eerie parallels between what we're dealing with today and what happened during the time of Frederick Douglass. And this is one of the reasons why we cannot take any of our rights for granted. But because of the outstanding advocacy and leadership of people like Frederick Douglass and, and others, we embarked on a, a struggle, a successful struggle, to change the Constitution. And Thurgood Marshall said something very important in his critique of this somewhat seductive legal theory of what you call originalism, that when you look at the Constitution, you should look at the original intent. And he said that that was nonsense. And he said it was nonsense because the founders were flawed and didn't get it right. How can you say you got it right when you said half of the population couldn't vote, you, you endorsed or at least tacitly approved of chattel slavery. So there's nothing that can grow out of that that was uh, positive uh, and that would, would reflect on who and what we are. So this idea that, that, this, that, that this Constitution got it right at the beginning was not the case. And so uh, Justice Marshall argues persuasively that it was not until the radical reconstructive amendments of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments that we finally got the Constitution right, that we finally began to uh, recognize the full rights and humanities, eliminating chattel slavery, protecting the, uh, and pro uh, providing the rights to vote, and protecting the full rights of citizenship. And so some would argue that that was a high watermark. And we're good, right? 13, 14, 15 Amendment, right? We're good. Well, we know what happened. And what's so amazing about this history is that in our whole history, 250 plus years of, 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 of uh, being part of uh, this, this, this country and this nation, there's only small slivers of time where we enjoyed full participation in our democratic society where we were not playing defense. Mm. And one of those times was during Reconstruction. And think about it. Generously, we're talking 11 years, right? Generously. But look at what happened during those incredible periods of time. We created institutions. Historically, black colleges and universities, although some were, were certainly developed uh, before that, that, that's when they began to grow 
and develop. We had black legislators. And what was so interesting in, in connecting a dot and going back to the Boule, our found, principal founder is a, a man by the name of Henry McKee Minton. And he's important. He graduated in 1871 during Reconstruction. But what's remarkable about him and his family was that his father graduated from the University of South Carolina Law School in 1876. 1876. His mother and his mother's family were some of the most affluent uh, uh, persons in America. So this period of time was one where um, African Americans began to realize not just their legal rights, but began to become part of, of the larger community. But we quickly began to see a retrenchment of those rights and an attack on those rights and candidly an interpretation of those rights that did not sufficiently impact our communities or express what was truly meant by those amendments. And in fact, through legal actions that culminated in the Plessy versus Ferguson decision mm -hmm. in 1896, we saw a complete retrenchment of those rights. We saw through the black codes and the state in, in, in this and the state legislatures and domestic terrorism a retrenchment of those rights. And so those eleven years were met by five, six, seven decades of retrenchment. But there was resistance. And what was so um, compelling was that there were a group of fearless, courageous, and smart people who led the struggle and understood that this was going to be a decades-long process. One of the things that we know is that when Charles Hamilton Houston, by show of hands, how many people know Charles Hamilton Houston? Thank you. That's not, I usually don't get that many hands, so I appreciate. So our educators in the room are doing a great job. But for those who don't, and, for, and I realize we're live streaming, let me just share a little bit about Charles Hamilton Houston, because he again is, is building on this tradition of Frederick Douglass. Charles Hamilton Houston, like Henry McKee Minton, kind of came from a very prominent family. He went to Amherst, graduated Phi Beta Kappa. He went on to Harvard Law School, and then went on to get a doctorate in law. He was, in my opinion, one of the top five most educated and accomplished lawyers of his generation. He went on to become dean of Howard Law School where he educated a generation of lawyers who were trained to dismantle state-sponsored segregation. His most prominent student, of course, was Thurgood Marshall. He goes on to be the founding director of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and established a legal the strategy to dismantle Jim Crow. And he, along with lawyers across the country. And what's so critical about, about that is that he understood, like Frederick Douglass, that this was going to be a long-term strategy. Those strategies started in the 1930s and culminated, in, of course, in the landmark Brown versus Board of Education decision. And so he understood that this was going to be a long-term strategy to dismantle that that had occurred over the previous seven decades. And so for him and for his excellence, he understood that the same qualities that, uh, that Frederick Douglass brought, this fearlessness, uh, this commitment to education and excellence, was something that he had to bring to the struggle. And they largely succeeded. Brown versus Board, Board of Education was, uh, was a unanimous decision. That along with the civil rights struggle of, of Dr. King and, and, and Rosa Parks and others uh, led to landmark civil rights legislation in uh, both the state and at the federal level. We understood that these laws gave us another window of opportunity starting in 1964 into 1965. There was a brief window, and then we start playing defense again. Right? We begin to see the retrenchment of those rules. To, to note, in many instances, 
Brown was not fully implemented in some instances until the 1970s, right? So, that, so there was mass resistance to, to those laws. Other laws were, um, were, were enacted and were, were protected. We had a complete change in the way we um, issued immigration. Those quotas were taken out and we led to the immigration that we see in, um, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s and beyond. Um, where those were completely cut off right before. And so that, that landmark legislation was another example of us moving forward and living up to the spirit of what the Constitution should be. But again, it was met by massive resistance. And we're there again, where we see, where we see that what the gains that we had post reconstruction the civil rights era we're back to a point where we're playing defense and this is the call to action first we have to understand what's going on right we have to be clear about what we're facing and why one of the things i talked about both privately and publicly about this last election presidential election it was all about the courts when people say, why did um, certain uh, constituents back um, the, re the Republican nominee, it was all about the courts at the, uh, at the district appeals and at the Supreme Court level. Make no mistake about it. There is a open, brazen strategy to go back to an originalist attempt, uh, analysis and interpretation of the Constitution. Now remember what originalism is. Originalism is where you say, I'm gonna look at the intent, the original intent of the founders. Where are we in, in that picture? Where are women in that picture? So when someone says that it's originalist, I say that's bankrupt. So we have to be clear about when a, a nominee says they're originalists, even when they look like us. So that's the first thing. The second thing that is critical is we have to be clear about what it means to a, attack press. One of the things the founders did get right was the need to have a free and independent press. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so glad that, that I have my, my friend and colleague, Jamal Watson, here from Diverse Issues. Uh, and even though we have to have our own press and our own views and analysis, we have to vigorously protect the press. Again, the reason why we're so concerned about what happened in Saudi Arabia is that when you look at any fascist regime, any authoritarian regime, the first thing to do is cut off information and access to the press. And so when you begin to see attacks on the press, wholesale attacks on the press, you need to be concerned and you have to take action and you cannot stay passive in, in the wake of that. Because when you begin to question whether the information you're receiving is factual, when you can't believe when when the press are doing their job, that is are so very dangerous. The reasons why the First Amendment are so critical, remember what the First Amendment is. The First Amendment gives you as an ordinary citizen the right to criticize the government, right? You have the right to say, you're, whether it's the dog catcher to the president, I disagree with your policy and the way you're conducting your business. There are many people across the globe who do not have that right or live in fear that if they engage in that, they will lose their lives. So our brother who was just killed pre uh, with due premeditation, that's exactly what happened. He was criticizing his home government and he was killed for it. And it sends a chilling um, effect on all of us. So we have to be concerned about our civil liberties, which goes to our other point. Another fundamental part of who and what we are is the ability to vote, to use our franchise, to have our say 
in how policy is made. And make no mistake about it, your rights to vote and to use your franchise are under attack. And our communities are under attack. And if we don't recognize that and fight vigorously to make sure not just that we get to vote, but our communities get to vote, we will be in trouble. One of the reasons why this actions have been so uh, meditate and, and, and increasingly brazen is because they understand the consequences. They understand the demographic realities. They understand that that, that vote means that these actions will be held accountable. And so for us, and as for our communities, we have to protect that franchise. The other thing is, we have to call things out as they are. I was sharing with, uh, with uh, Drs. Jackson and Moore that after the South Carolina um, uh, terrorism in, in the historic AME church where nine persons were killed, uh, I wrote a statement of condemnation. And I said that the, the, the killer was a domestic terrorist. And my communication person said, you sure you want to say that? And I said, yes. We have to start calling out things and stop sugarcoating what is going on in our country. What happened over the last few days in the United States was an act of domestic terrorism, where elected officials who are trying to protect our interests were being terrorized and it, it's meant to set fear across the community. That's what terrorism did. That's what the Klan did. They engage in this activity to hinder and prevent our advocacy. But in the spirit of Frederick Douglass, we have to be fearless and engage in that activity and call out what is going on. And that's one of the reasons why Congresswoman Waters is, is such a compelling figure because she calls out what's going on. And we have to have a similar commitment to make that happen. We also have to engage in an explicit anti-racism, anti-misogyny agenda. It's not enough to talk about diversity and inclusion and because Dr. Jackson likes anchovies and Dr. Moore likes pepperoni, you know, and I like cheese on my, my pizza, we're diverse, right? You know, it's no longer okay that, oh, I let one of y'all in the room, right? We have to fundamentally dismantle the institutions and the practices that are, that are promoting this misogyny and racism and other isms in our, in our country. We can no longer sit on the sidelines and say that's not really, the immigration issue is not really about us. What, what Frederick Douglass taught us is that that issue is our issue. That if, it, if it's impacting an Irish farm, it's in, impacting me. That inescapable network of mutuality. I am a member of the Episcopal Church and I'm so very proud that my fellow alum of Hobart is the, um, is the Pres is the uh, presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, Michael Curry. Many of you saw him when he preached um, at the uh, royal wedding. And he is engaged in a, in a national, international campaign of racial reconciliation, racial justice, anti-racism. We have to hit a full, full frontal attack on what is going on in our world and call it for what it is and not sugarcoat it. So for us, this work means that we have to put in some capital. We have to, in times, get into harm's way and get out of our comfort zones. That means that at times we're going to have to get out of the ivory tower and get elbow to elbow with our communities. And in fact, the most radical thing you can do besides graduate for you folks who are still in school. My, one of my professor, it was on uh, Malcolm X's birthday, um, I was a bit of a student activist. He said, what is the most radical thing you can do? I said, take over the administration building. And um, he said, no, graduate. Right. And I always remembered that. Um, but what's, what's critical, right, what's critical is that we, we have to 
understand what's going on in our communities. And so another part of our gender has to be engaged scholarship, engaged teaching, and engaged service. We have to make sure that our work is relevant to our communities, that it's directly impacting our liberation. It has to be about using data, good information, to inform our communities, to stay connected with institutions. Because the other important part of this work has to be, must be, protecting our institutions. Because make no mistake about it, our institutions are under attack as well. Going back to that historic Amy Church, that was not by accident that that church, that historic AME church that had been part of the liberation struggle for centuries was attacked. That was not, by, it was not some random act. They knew exactly what they were doing in attacking that particular church and the AME tradition. Our HBCUs are under attack. We have to protect our, hist our historically black colleges and universities. Now, they have to change as well, and, and many of them are doing some incredibly innovative things to serve their communities. But we have to protect, whether you attend or your family attended or not, we have a vested interest in making sure that our HBCUs are protected. We have to protect our national institutions. Even when we criticize, and, and sometimes appropriately so, their actions, but institutions that have been around for centuries, like the Urban League, like the NAACP and other organizations, like our fraternities and sororities, we have to protect them while holding them accountable. But those institutions have the memory. The black press, that's another organization. Part of the liberation struggle has been being able to tell that story in an effective way. And so we have to protect our institutions while also staying connected to the larger global context. And finally, we have to engage in alliances that promote and protect our permanent interests. Um, one uh, really famous um, term that I'm sure all of you heard, but it bears repeating, that we should not have permanent friends, but we should always have a permanent interest. And we need to identify what those permanent interests are. Educational equity has to be part of our permanent interest. Making sure that every child gets a quality education. In the Brown decision, the, the unanimous court said that education is the very foundation of good citizenship. And it's unlikely that any child can fully participate in our democratic society without a quality education. And that providing education is perhaps the most important function of state and local government. Educational equity has to be part of our permanent interest. And so making sure that every child has that. One of the things that I reflect on is that with my children, there's no way they were gonna fail. We were gonna provide every opportunity for them to succeed. And they will succeed. There's no other option. We have to have that same attitude for all of our children. And it's not good enough that we're good. We gotta make sure that everybody else is good. Educational equity has to be part of our permanent interests. Living in healthy communities. It should be a crime. People, someone should be in jail for what has happened in Flint, Michigan. One thing every person who lives in this country, most prosperous country in the world, they should be able to drink water safely and not worry that it's gonna cause permanent damage to, who, to, to, their, to their family. Living in healthy communities, holding our elected officials and, 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 and other stakeholders accountable for making sure that we live in healthy communities, holding ourselves accountable for living healthy lifestyles is an important part of our permanent interests. Creating and sustaining our communities, sustaining wealth, sustaining 
economic viability and sustainability has to be part of our permanent interests. How do we make sure that our resources are connected to our businesses, uh, our communities, that, that, our, that our institutions are protected and we are paying attention to what that means. And that does mean representation on corporate uh, boards and, and, and participation, but it also means that small businesses um, are, are viable as well and we have to support those enterprises. Economic viability and sustainability has to be part of our permanent interests. And a vigorous defense of our fundamental rights and dignity. We cannot allow anyone, whether it's the president or anyone else, dehumanize anyone who's part of our village and our community. Right. We cannot allow that to happen. We cannot allow the, um, persons, human beings, to be called dogs and, 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 and other dehumanizing things because that's a slippery slope to some of the worst human atrocities in human history. That's how it starts. We have to be vigorous, and even if it's not directed at us, we have to be that moral compass that Frederick Douglass was and making sure that that is not tolerated, that that's not acceptable, that is not normalized. Human dignity, protecting human dignity is something that is part of our permanent interests. And protecting our fundamental rights, protecting the right to vote, protecting the right to express ourselves, to worship as we please, to assemble as we please, to marry, who we please, all of those things are an important part of who and we, what we are. And we cannot let these dehumanizing behaviors get normalized because once they do, they're like an insidious cancer mm. and it will take radical surgery to dislodge it. <clears throat> so we can't let it connect in the first place. So in the spirit of Frederick Douglass, in the spirit of Harriet Tubman and all of those persons who laid the foundation we have an affirmative obligation to honor them by this call to action, to call it like it is, to protect those individuals who are not in a position to protect themselves, and to advocate and protect our permanent interests. You all are in a unique position to be able to do that, being in the academy, by being part of this educated community, not just for yourselves, but for the broader community. We indeed stand on the shoulders of giants, but there are others who are looking to stand on our shoulders. And it is a incredible obligation. But in the spirit of these liberators, this, in the spirit of these heroes and heroines, we have the power, we have the tradition, we have the excellence to do this work and to do it well, and to do it in a way that's, that's sustaining, that's honorable, and that gives tribute to those persons who gave their lives to all of us. Thank you all very much. Vincent, uh, please don't leave just yet. Uh, we have a couple of tokens of appreciation for you. Thank we you. have a, a ticket uh, that um, wow. replicates the what uh, a, uh, invitation to a, a uh, speaking event would have looked like during Douglas's time. Um, and Dr. Moore has also a coin, a uh, commemorative coin to share for your appreciation for making time and coming all the way over and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you. Thank right, you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Our last two final sessions are actually in this room, and so you don't have to get up unless you're presenting. Uh, the presenters will present here uh, to the left-hand side, and then we'll have our closing session. Uh, so um, we'll ask the those that are presenting in the next session to make their way to the front of the room. And our moderator, 
as well.